Yes, sir. You've chosen to be Miami Dade College. We can ask that, and then we're going to go back to some of your, your background, how you wound up there. Why Miami Dade when the whole world is open to you? Well, Miami Dade College is um, sort of where it all started for me. It's really what launched my career, um, and I've been with them since 2009, teaching philosophy and critical thinking as an adjunct, and um, I haven't left. I became full-time um, professor down in Homestead, uh, one of the eight campuses at Miami Dade College for, for two years, but then it was always my dream to get my PhD, and, um, and so I, I left the full-time position to do my PhD, and I finished, that was in 2013, I finished in 2018, uh, and then went on and had a couple of other jobs. And um, when this position opened up, this particular position that I'm in now currently, um, it was it was too good to be true. I couldn't say no. It uh, Again, it's where it all started for me personally. And then, um, yeah, like it launched my career. And so that's a personal sort of reason. A professional career reason is, is I just love the ethos of Miami-Dade College, right? Opportunity changes everything. And that's, that's the, the vibe, that's the philosophy and the motivation behind Miami Dade College. It's one of the largest, if not the largest college in the, in the nation in terms of undergraduate enrollment. So the, the reach, the community uh, engagement, um, what Miami Dade College does for locally, you know, at a statewide level, at a national level, is incredible. And the students are, um, I've worked at other colleges. Um, um, University of Miami was one of them, and just not to sort of compare and contrast, but the, the students at Miami Dade College are truly something special. They are authentic, they are vulnerable, they want to impact the world and create better lives for themselves and their community, and there's nothing like that. It's super rewarding. So, and you are now heading up the Artificial Intelligence Center at Miami yep. Dade College. Yeah. We can do a little background first. I'm going to just make sure I can get it right. Okay. Okay. There we go. All, you, you got your, keep going down, keep going down. You got your bachelor's at, where is that? At Florida Institute, Florida Institute of Technology yep. in astrophysics. Yes. Can we call you an astrophysicist? Uh, <laughs> Folks, this is it. First time. <laughs> Here we go. Right, right. Um, unofficially, yes. <laughs> Not officially. Okay. And you, work, you worked at um, NASA. Yeah, so right. I, yeah. Then you got your yeah. master's at California State University in Los Angeles. That's correct. In yeah. philosophy. In philosophy, yes. And then you went to Florida Atlantic, which is right down the street from here. Yep. 30, 40, 60 miles from here. And yep. PhD in neuroscience and complex systems. Yes. That's just hard for me to even say, but so let's think about <laughs> right. it. And you, went, you worked at the University of Miami. Yep. For a while, you did some work there. Yeah. Uh, we, we knew a few years ago you were on te one of the TEDx shows. Yes, I did a TEDx talk right. uh, locally here. Actually, and one of the things that I saw in that, uh, and before we get on to the AI, is you talked about goals, and that that mm. if you have no goal, mm -hmm. or you have a, a direct goal, very specific, mm -hmm. or you sort of mix in there, the brain registers those things. That's correct. E yeah, even at the level of the brain, we can put people in brain scanners who have very very clear goals, um, that are smart goals. They're specific, measurable. It's an acronym: smart, measurable. Uh, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, so those are specific things. And then you could put the people in scanners who have just sort of ambiguous goals that are not very clear, that are not highly specific, and then people just with no but, goals. But how do you know and there's the changes. goals are, th are there? Well, because you ask them first. Oh, you, oh, you, you, oh, so this is an immediate response. Th that's the correct. Brain. That's correct. You, you, you ask them, you know, you assess them, and you, you, you give them questions and, and surveys about that kind of thing, and then you could actually see Biologically, when you have specific goals, biologically it changes your biology to make yourself more likely to achieve those goals. I'll give you an example. Um, I'll give you two examples. <clears throat> and this is really what it means to get your biology to work for you rather than against you, to increase your well-being, to increase your life satisfaction, your quality of life, and your performance as a human being. One example is um, there's an area of the brain in the, uh, toward, toward the middle of the brain and the lower, about maybe the neck area, um, called the retic reticular activating system. And, and <clears throat> that is involved in perception and translating and interpreting all of the information that comes into your senses 
And when you have specific goals, it changes that area of the brain and changes the way that area of the brain filters information to make your goals more likely. So you're literally, when you have those goals, and think about this from an evolutionary perspective, right? Going back in our ancestors, when they had specific goals to build this, to get that food, to survive, um, they needed to have those specific goals to achieve those things and to survive, right, from an evolutionary perspective. So we know that social media has tapped into that. Because as soon as you start That's watching right. a video on a certain subject, you're going to find more of them. That is not coincidental. That's correct. It is made for that. That's, and that's in service of the goals of social media, yes. <laughs> uh, manipulating the information that you um, perceive. And this is a, gets, gets into a lot of things that we're working at in Miami-Dade College, right? Transparency, ethics, data privacy, so AI. We, so we used but to anyway. think those things are coincidental. But I was watching a show that's been over for about three years. And there was an actor in it who was about, I barely recognized him because last time I'd seen him was like 20 years before. And I'm watching TV, and I'm watching the show, and I'm flipping through Facebook. He shows up. Yeah. I'm right there. I go, that's not an accident. Yeah. All right? It felt it, read it, where, wherever way that is. But let's talk about artificial yeah. intelligence. So the, the, you can do that. People, sorry to interrupt you, by yeah, the way. Just, I want to lose this thought. So you can, we can use AI in the right way for positive kinds of things where it can benefit our lives in that way. But other people with agendas uh, can use AI in ways that can actually um, manipulate and force us to go down one path rather than the other. And, uh, and we see that for, for better and for worse, this is going to be that whole range. That's right. And for somebody that, that's just now starting to do things, we, we had a team yeah. meeting the other day and I put in under, you know, I started a new chat. I said, uh, write a introduction to a podcast called The Addiction Show, offered by, I put the person's name in, and presented by uh, Miami's Community Newspapers. And, it's, and it came out, it was beautiful. Yeah. It was perfect. He used the key words that were in there, yep. and he did it, and it was like terrific. Yeah. And what you realize, because you said you just have to feed things into your life, right? you realize when you put it in there, it takes it, mixes it around, and it can give you back information. That's right. So... Here we have a whole new generation that AI and chat type of products are going to be open and available to everybody. Right. Tell us about the classes. At Miami-Dade College? At Miami-Dade College. Yeah. So we have, we've just launched uh, four programs, uh, four different pathways for students with no, you can, you know, all walks of life, right? All kinds of levels, no coding, very little or no maths involved. They are two CCCs, college credit certificates. Um, which I'll describe to you in a second. Then we have the first of its kind, really in the state and in the nation, um, associate's degree uh, in applied AI, and then a, a bachelor's of science degree as well in applied AI. So these are all applied AI. And so the associate, the the, C, the first CC is in AI awareness, and that's one semester. And you is that in house or both? Uh, both. Okay. Both. Yeah. You can take it in one semester, three courses. Uh, AI thinking, so it's a little bit about AI literacy, fundamentals of AI, uh, then AI ethics. So right off the bat, students are learning about these accountable accountability issues, responsibility issues, fairness issues, ethical issues with AI. And then a course uh, specifically for the particular domain and subject matter that the, that student wants to pursue. So we, right now we have an AI in business course, for example, um, that you could take. Then we have an AI practitioner. So that's, a, that's two semesters, and these are all stackable, by the way. So if you do the two CCs, then you're halfway done the applied, uh, the associate's degree. Uh, the AI practitioner is not only about learning a fundamental awareness of the concepts of AI, what, what it can be used for, how it's gonna change things. You get a little bit more technical expertise. So you're gonna learn a little bit about more machine learning. So the, uh, one thing that yeah. keyed my interest when you said no math, that's so important because yep. we know on college level, that's a right. huge percentage of people fail their college yeah. math. Yeah, so that's the whole um, ethos and motivation behind these, these different programs, being the first of its kind, is not so much, I mean, there's a major flaw. There's two reasons. One is there's a major flaw in thinking that uh, to do AI and to understand AI, to contribute to AI, you need a master's degree or a PhD degree. Um, that's, that's not going to be the case with all of these jobs that are going to be coming online in the future. We call this a blue-collar AI. 
Um, and um, there's a, a lot of research that shows that we really need an army of blue collar AI workers out there who can fulfill these jobs because bi every kind of business, your funeral, home, your flower shop, whatever, a small to medium business, there's, you're going to be left behind if you're not incorporating AI in some way. So that's these, these, uh, these pathways are, are really dedicated to in terms of workforce development. When the internet first came out, I remember saying to myself, you either get on this train or you're going to be lost. And yeah. I remember very specifically saying, I get the same sense about this. That's right. About AI. This is so significant. This is massive. Right? It's, it's, it, we can't even imagine in practice and in principle uh, really what it's going to be like. And there, there's a huge tech talent shortage. Right? There's a massive, massive skills gap. The, the global market for AI, um, I think right now it's like 150 billion. It, by 2030, it's going to be 1,500 billion, so trillion. So all these companies, big, big companies, so that's the thing. Big companies are saying it's enormously difficult to be able to hire the people with these skills, right? So that's number one, to fill that, to fill that, you know, that, that talent, tech talent shortage. But then again, with the small and medium businesses that, like you're saying, are going to be left behind and it's going to be such a massive shift in the way these businesses are going to use AI, that's going to, that, this, these programs are going to fulfill that need. I, I experiment all the time, and I've never done any study, and I might do that, all right? But yeah, I put on a description, I'd say write a commercial for my Mies Community News, 30-second radio commercial. You write the commercial. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. And, and for, for our use, I know whether it is accurate or not, all right? I do not talk about getting other people's stuff, which I know because it, That's right. All right? So I'm not even venturing into that. But what we realize for the things that we want to do here, is say prepare, prepare a team meeting, sales yeah. meeting, for a digital company, a newspaper, magazine. And it's clear enough that the goals are clear that you can fill in the rest of it That's without, right, yeah. without ever having to wonder, okay, do these five steps. I and mean, listen, review the last time here, go over this, have a, a presentation about your new products, yeah. review your recent sales, things that would have taken somebody hours to put together. And this is enough prompting that he'd go, this is tremendous. And I did some work, yeah. just a few words in front of our team the other day, three or four of them, and it was great. Yeah, that's an example of this, this idea of generative AI. It can generate content, it create, can kind of create content. At Miami at College, we're embracing that. So much a little bit, uh, well, I should say not a little bit, much like um, how math teachers embrace the calculator. And still, like that was, if you look at the history of having calculators in the classroom, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very controversial. It's, it's really interesting history. The, the way I see my innocence, this is going to be easier to figure out how to do than coding. That's right, yeah. You no don't question. Need, no, que no question. And that's back to the programs at my college. Very little math, very little coding, m less emphasis on the technical expertise and more emphasis on AI literacy and the, um, the ability to implement an AI. And that's, by the way, just a, a, hu a huge point here that I, uh, I should mention, it, it's, it's really about developing an AI mindset and an AI literacy, uh, like a, almost like a scientific literacy. This is T in, in STEM, yep. right? Technical literacy. Uh, Carl Sagan, one of my major gurus and uh, heroes, said, we live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology in which almost nobody knows anything about science and technology. And that's a problem. That is that creates major, major issues at all levels of government in the community. And it, at a philosophical level, these programs are addressing that. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So Mike, let's talk about the ethics involved and in content that is created that you stimulate. All right. And I, you know, I practice that all the time, and I put in stuff, and, and it's all custom to the stuff, the information that I put in perfectly. All right. Yeah. I put in, here's some of our partners, I list 20 of them, and so they listed 10 and more, yeah. and then went down. It was perfect, all right? It was accurate, very creative. There's some words that I didn't like. That, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the question that people ask me, when does it become ethically okay to put your name on that? If you created that yeah. content, that it was because of the information that you put in, that you got back stuff for you, right? right? 
What is, what is, what what are in five years from now? What's it? What is that question going to be? Or uh, that answer going to be? I'm going to be completely honest. I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. Um, that's a philosophical question, right? That's that's a very that's a moral question, and um, there's debates on both sides of that, right? I I think one um, we're going to have to have a paradigm shift, a qualitatively distinct way of thinking about the way we interact with technology and co how content is created, how music is created, how art is created, and that kind of thing. And when it becomes like, who owns it? Um, how can you sell it? Uh, what value does it have? Where did it come from? Did it come from a combination of your brain and the computer? Um, think about this, like, you know, it, there's, we offload some of our cognition out into the environment, like maps, or um, like think about Scrabble. Right, like you're playing Scrabble and um, you have the letters and you're thinking of a word and you're moving the letters around, you're physically interacting with the environment and so you're sort of offloading some of the working memory tasks that your brain is doing into the, into the physical world, right? To, to manipulate the, the physical world to be able to do that. Um, we do that with our phones, right? So how much of your mind is literally in your phone? This is a whole field of research, by the way, called embodied cognition. So it gets to a really deep question about, you know, when is it okay to put your name on something that you, that the technology helped you create? So if we were writing a commercial and it got, and it was written by AI and the ad agency or whoever was presented it, and no name goes on it, that's been done for decades. Yeah. All right. When the president speaks, he didn't write that. We know that. Right. right? They have right. a speechwriter. Yeah. But yet there's no, hey, I didn't write that's, it. That's I'm, a good example. He, he just, I tell people, they come out, I look at it. He's communicating at, the message, yeah, and, but he agrees with it. It's still in his head. It's still right. He he, he goes over the speech. Um, it's coming from it, part of it, like at least the content of the speech, right? And the spirit behind the speech is still um, it, in his head, right? It's it's he. It's there's a there's an assent to that the content in the, in the speech, right? So I so think there, there are a lot of people that write books, or their name is on it. That ghost they wrote writers, the book. yeah. So how do we? How do you deal with? That's a ghostwriter. Call it AI, yeah. if you will. Yeah. And I don't know what percentage are actually written by the person, but the reality is they hire writers to do that. And then you go. So if it's okay for them to put their name on it, maybe there is written cooperation with so and so. Yeah. We, we can see that. Yeah. I saw a local newspaper was doing some AI work on real estate. So they said this was created by such such a bot with assistance from AI. The, yeah. There you go. Yeah. And, and that seems to yeah. be a, a more truthful way to do that. But we come from a place, no, it has to be a person that's going to go do that. I think also the context depends, is, like, is it, is, it, is it music, right? Is it, is it an artwork? Is it an NFT? Um, or is it uh, a law, right? Is it legislation? Um, those, what, those kinds of, I think context really kind of matters in terms of like being able to represent how this came to into existence. And, and I see there are already some lawsuits. Hey, that's our information. You stole it and you're using it as if you were the one. Right. Like stealing somebody's picture yeah. or an image on the internet. We had a street sign one time. You heard about the lawyer too, by the way. I want to mention. Go ahead with your story. And we had, wound up paying $400. It was somebody else's picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, so I asked about the, stat, the statute of limitations because it was online. Yeah. And so our lawyers said, listen, you might be able to win it, but the statute of limitations from when it appeared, and it's on the internet, it appeared today. Yeah. So people need to be so, very careful of that. Uh, correct, yeah. Right. And this is back to your original point yeah. about the ethical implications, right? Yeah. Um, what's fair, right? Who, I mean, there's, there's really deep questions about who's accountable. Um, uh, are we being fair, responsible, um, in terms of like things like discrimination and privacy breaches? and things like that. These kinds of questions about like how did things come into existence and who created them and who owns these kinds of things, like the, the president's speech, um, those are, are also interesting philosophical questions about the, and especially now with Gen AI, right? Generative AI, it's creating content, that kind of thing. The other ethical questions, I'm not even talking about Gen AI, it's, um, you know, deals with a lot of other issues about like facial recognition and discrimination and, and that kind of thing.
So in a big picture, artificial intelligence is this big umbrella thing that underneath that, there are all these very specific products like chat GPT is one of those things. Correct. Right. And there are a bunch of other ones that are out there. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. will there be, will there be lots more and are, are there going to be some that are going to be exceptionally better than the other ones? Oh, absolutely. I think, um, with any kind of technology, uh, you always have first movers and then there's a technological adoption curve and then you have people who come on the scene that iterate upon it and, and approve upon it. So your chat GPT is the first, um, example of like publicly accessible um, generative AI um, with language. So that's natural language understanding. Um, <clears throat> but then there's Dolly with art and mid journey and those kinds of things. But we will see, to your point, a, a plethora of technologies that come out uh, that don't don't only generate content um, specifically for like language use or art, but it could be like music, it could be um, Gen AI that just doing law um, and so, so on. So this is going to be this wide range of applications, just like the internet, but from back when. And, yeah. And we we knew back when that the big newspapers that had this model to follow, they couldn't stay current with the internet companies that didn't have any legacy. That's right. Yeah. In that time frame that it took the legacy products to adapt yeah. to what the people were using was part of their demise. Right. Right. They just couldn't the lag. Yeah. And yeah. and in this case, I, I just have this gut feeling. I, you can see it that it's happening. It's sort of like pickleball. Pickleball has been oh, around yeah. for, for forty years, but it's been the last three years. Really? That, okay, that it's, wow. and it's, yeah. been, it's sort of like that actor. Look what all these so much yeah. success in the last three. Yeah, but he's been yeah. acting for thirty years. Yeah. And same with pickleball. It's gone, gone like completely crazy, but it's been there. And so, That's so I, yeah. I sense with this AI, it's what's going to happen is there going to be a whole bunch of people that are going to get left behind. And that if I mean, you know, my suggestion, if you're over the age of 15, right, or earlier, just have a working knowledge that right. this is out there. Right. And there, there's going to be some application someday yeah. for, you know, for each of us. It will be ubiquitous. It will be completely universal, right? Um, like the Internet. I think the Internet's a great example. Um, uh, like smartphones, right? Like th th those kinds of technologies. It will be, we will be interacting with it in seamless ways where we don't even know we're interacting with it. It will change our lives. It will improve, in my opinion, our lives to a great extent. And um, that's what we mean by sort of AI literacy, right? It's, it's understanding, recognizing AI, how to interact with it, um, how to cope with it, what are the, some of the ethical considerations uh, about it. Uh, and if we get on board now, right, with programs like at Miami Dade College, we can, we can get ahead of the curve, so to speak, to make things optimal. Okay. I want to read something that's on your LinkedIn. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. 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 So some of your, your main passions are all things brain, yep. including AI, <clears throat> brain computer interface, cognitive enhancement, peak performance, and flow science, yeah. and neurotechnology <clears throat> and brain-related disorders, fitness, exercise, and functional movement, especially in relation to the brain and the concept, conceptual framework called embodied um, cognition. Yeah. Also critical thinking, and it goes on and on. What's the connection between when you are a a real fitness guy, all right? Yeah. I've seen some of your stuff. <laughs> yes. All right. Sometimes, and what's that connection between being fit mm. and being in a program oh. and your and your brain with the brain is a it, correct me if I'm wrong. That is like an arm. It's a thing. Then you have your mind part in there. Explain how all that works together because of movement and exercise. That is such a great question. Okay, so um, it turns out that your mind, this is what neuroscience has shown, right? Modern neuro cognitive neuroscience and, and psychology, that your mind um, is not analog analogize, analogizing to computers, right? Your mind is not a software um, and your brain is the hardware, like a computer, right? That, we, that was a metaphor that neuroscience used for a long, long time, decades. Turns out that that's not quite correct. It's, it's actually completely wrong. Um, your mind is, a, and your personality, your desires, your wishes, your, your strengths, your values, everything that goes on when you think about your mind is not really just in your brain, right? It's in your body, and it's in your, it's in, it's in your foot, it's in your hand, it's how you move. It's in the coordination between systems in your body. And um, that becomes very, very relevant for the relationship between the mind and the body. And so it turns out that um, there's a whole field called sp 
a well, bunch of fields called sports neuroscience and embodied cognition, that how you move, right, uh, your mind depends on how you move. And it, it affects your, your psychology and your ability to make decisions and working memory. Give you a really quick example. A study came out a few years ago showing that London stock traders who have higher interoception, which means they are more sensitive to the beating of their hearts. They're more sensitive to the temperatures in the body. They're more sensitive to the moving movements of their gut. Make better decisions in trading decisions on the trading floor. So, so it turns out that people with higher interoception, right, higher interoceptive sensitivity and accuracy. So if you just sit there and you try and feel the beating of your heart, um, people who can do that better have better minds, better higher levels of mental wellness, mental well-being, life satisfaction, things like that, right? So there's a very rich, rich connection between the mind and the body, how the body moves, cognition and your personality just doesn't depend on your brain, like the computer and the software. It depends on what's going on in your body, how sensitive you are to that, how you're moving your body, and so on. Well, I'm That's glad, what that means. I'm glad you brought that up because for 15 years, I've known that I've had a hearing issue. I go to the doctors, the first one's, oh, it's selective hearing, blah, 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 it goes on and on and on. Finally, I got tired of asking my wife, what did you say, what did you say, what did you say? At the same time, I was having vertigo off and on for oh. years. Now, when I got yeah. the hearing aids, I have not had, and maybe I've just been lucky, yeah. any vertigo problems. Oh, wow. The connection between having my brain stimulated and being on course and understanding where my body is Correct. versus on vertigo, if you haven't had it, you don't want it. Yeah. Spinning around and holding on, total disorientation, and they always tell you, keep your eyes open so you can focus. This so far, and it's been months, right, has helped me balance, and I walk better yeah. because I know where I am in relationships to the yeah. other things that are there, and to your point. That's right. It's when all that is working together, it's this whole function, it's not it, just it, you, se a separate thing. How you walk, um, how you're moving your hands with gestures, there's meaning in this, right? And we're the way we communicate. And so it's all about the body and how it, inter in, it interacts with the, with the world and with the environment and with each other that really facilitates and, and produces, literally produces consciousness and cognition. And the way we think and make decisions and remember things and um, regulate our emotions. By the way, this is how, to connect this back to AI and technology. Yes. This is one reason, in my opinion, as a neuroscientist, uh, that um, an expert in AI, I would say, that you know, all of the AI that's in the uh, all the AI that we're doing right now in society that that we've just discussed, right, is, is, an, is one kind of AI. It's a narrow AI. It's a weak AI. Yeah. It's just specific to do specific tasks that hu mimic human tasks. Uh, but then there's artificial general intelligence, right, um, or strong AI. And that's when AI becomes conscious and um, has values and rights and things like that. Because it's, it's not just computation. Consciousness, and to get really deep on you and <laughs> philosophical, Cognition and consciousness is not just computation and ones and zeros. It's, it's embodied. One of the things that I've learned in my couple months of practicing is that I'm giving information to the chat and I'm, I'm seeing how it's being processed. No, that's not quite what I want. Mm. I'm looking for something different. It makes you think. Mm -hmm, all right? mm -hmm. You're putting stuff in. Good, good. Yeah. And what are you getting back from it? Yes. No, that's not what I want. Yeah, all right? yes, then yeah, it makes you think about that. And that's, I think, one, one of the things your class is going to do if they can get to that point, which is this is going to make all of us think better about how and to move forward. Yeah, 100%. And that's the, like the human-centric AI. Um, that's why this is so important to think about the relationship between humans and technology. And there are people working on this, really, really amazing people working on this. There's a, a guy named Tristan Harris at, who, who created um, the Center for Humane Technology. Um, there's people all over working on this, uh, on this. And it's the interaction between our brains and technology and that feedback loop, right, that's going to really be that we can, if we leverage and get it right from the ground up, 
it's going to be a, a beautiful thing. It's going to optimize, it's going to increase life, human life, satisfaction, mental wellness, all of these things, mental health. So Miami Dade College and all of Miami Dade are lucky to have you. And you might say on the other end, Thank I'm you. lucky to have them. All right. When, when Madeline Premierga, the president of the school, was our guest recently, mm. she so inspired people in the audience, especially women, when she said, you can come to Miami-Dade and you become an electrician or you can go to MIT. You can walk out of here with no debt. You can learn what you need to. We are the pathway for success. Yes. She said there are over two and a half million millionaires that were created that, of it, that started off in Miami-Dade. And she's... And I got phone calls from women that say, Michael, I'm the single person she was talking about. I'm the one with the, with the two kids. Wow. I'm the one whose father, you know, could go to college. My mother cleaned the house. I'm the first one to go to college that I have no debt. She was talking to me. Yes. It was so inspiring. And, I, and Miami Dade has thousands of those stories that are there. And, and because of the work you're doing, yeah. you are affecting not just the student, but their whole family. Yeah, which is, the community. I yes. mean, it's, it's, and so yeah. when you do a bunch of that, you have this whole community. Professor, yeah. thank you so much. Michael, I appreciate thank you it. Thank you so much. Well, everything that was great. Thank okay. you so much. Folks, thank you for joining us. Thank and uh, call Miami Dade College, find out about the AI program. You'll love it. See you guys.